Hello Design Champions! In this video you will be learning about Office Furniture Spacing and Its Size NASF and Calculating Area Requirements Office or Space Types Location and Orientation FL equals FRG Furniture Layout Room Auditing Analysis and Synthesis Grid and Levels So let's begin! Furniture spacing refers to the amount of space that is left between pieces of furniture in a room. This space is important because it affects the overall feel and functionality of the room. Proper furniture spacing allows for easy movement and circulation, while also creating a sense of balance and harmony in the space. When determining the amount of space to leave between pieces of furniture, it is important to consider the size of the furniture in the room. In general, larger pieces of furniture will require more space, while smaller pieces can be placed closer together. Additionally, the purpose of the room should also be considered. For example, in a living room, a larger space may be left between the couch and coffee table to allow for easy movement and conversation, while in a bedroom, furniture may be placed closer together to create a more intimate and cozy feel. When it comes to furniture size, it's important to choose pieces that are proportionate to the room. A small room will look cramped and cluttered with large furniture, while a large room may feel empty with small furniture. It's also important to consider the height of the furniture in relation to the ceiling height. Pieces that are too tall can make a room feel cramped, while pieces that are too short can make a room feel unfinished. In summary, proper furniture spacing and size are important to create a functional, comfortable, and aesthetically pleasing space. The amount of space between furniture, the size of furniture, the room size and the purpose of the room should all be taken into consideration when arranging furniture. Net assigned square footage, NASF, of a built-up building refers to the total square footage of the building that is assigned or allocated to specific areas or spaces. This can include office spaces, retail spaces, residential units, and common areas. It is typically used to calculate the amount of space that is available for occupancy or lease, and can be used to determine the value or price of a building. Office Types A well-designed workplace can optimize the efficiency of all aspects of daily workflow, as well as improve the productivity, health, and satisfaction of employees. There are numerous options available for office layouts, each suited to different business needs. Private Space in Offices a business may need some amount of private office space. For example, some employees may work with confidential information, so you need the security of a separate enclosed space. Private offices require extra floor space, as well as separate air conditioner and lighting, which makes them the most expensive use of your office resources. A private space can increase productivity of some individuals due to a lack of interruptions, the distance put by this type of office space between employees can slow down cooperation in the long run. Open Office Spaces In this scenario you can build communication and collaboration between your employees with a well-designed open plan office. Teams that constantly collaborate can be positioned close to one another, keeping foot traffic to a minimum, while still keeping channels of communication open all the time. In addition, open plan offices have the highest capacity to optimize available floor space and sources of natural light or artificial light. Natural light is especially important in maintaining employee health and focus, and open plan offices can make the best use of windows to benefit all employees' well-being. The Health and Safety Executive HSE, in the UK recommends a luminance between 200 and 500 lux for a healthy well-light spaces. Open office spaces result in a much louder working environment, especially in spaces with a large number of employees. Large offices run up to 65 decibels of ambient noise, which can negatively impact employees that may struggle to concentrate. Cubicle office space. Cubicle layouts offer a compromise between open plan and private offices, tapping into some of the benefits that each can provide by dividing an open plan space with partitions. One needs to balance the exposure between workplace noise and natural light when deciding what type of partitions best for office environment. Full partitions reach from floor to ceiling and can provide the employees with a little more privacy and significantly reduction in the noise volumes of an open place space. 
One can also consider half partitions to further improve the availability of natural light, but these can adversely increase the noise output of your office. Partitions might even be mandated between workspaces as they offer an additional layer of safety between employees. Desk Layouts Even without partitions, different desk layouts can be used to optimize occupants' productivity and workflow, with various designs suited to different requirements and preferences. Teams that require frequent communication between members could benefit from a layout positioning around a central block of desks. Such layouts best for teams of four or less employees to make optimal use of desk and floor area. Alternatively, linear banks of desks can efficiently accommodate teams that may require less communication between co-workers. You can also consider a checkerboard pattern for desks, which enables employees to be within conversational distance. The location and orientation of a building. The location and orientation of a building with respect to the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, can have a significant impact on the building's design and energy efficiency. Orienting a building towards the south can maximize natural light and solar gain during the winter months, while orienting it towards the north can minimize solar heat gain during the summer months. Additionally, Proper orientation can also improve natural ventilation and reduce the need for artificial heating and cooling. In planning a building, it is important to consider the local climate and the specific needs of the building's occupants to determine the optimal orientation and location. The direction of a building can have a significant impact on the amount of solar radiation it receives. Buildings that are oriented towards the south will typically receive more solar radiation during the winter months, when the sun is lower in the sky, while buildings oriented towards the north will typically receive less radiation during the summer months, when the sun is higher in the sky. This can be beneficial in terms of energy efficiency, as it can reduce the need for artificial heating and cooling. However, buildings that receive too much solar radiation can also become overheated, which can lead to discomfort for the occupants and increased energy use. In order to optimize solar radiation and energy efficiency, it is important to consider the local climate and the specific needs of the building's occupants when determining the direction and orientation of the building. Furniture Layout Furniture layout refers to the arrangement and placement of furniture within a room or space. It is an important aspect of interior design and can have a significant impact on the functionality, comfort, and aesthetic of a room. The furniture layout should be designed to optimize the use of the space, take into account the flow of traffic and the focal points of the room. It also should be designed to create a cohesive and balanced look. There are different furniture layout styles such as symmetrical, asymmetrical, grid, and freeform. Each style has its own advantages and disadvantages, and the best layout will depend on the room's purpose, size, and shape, as well as the personal preferences of the occupants. In a symmetrical layout, furniture is arranged in a balanced, orderly fashion, with similar items placed on either side of a central point or axis. In an asymmetrical layout, furniture is arranged in a more informal, unbalanced fashion, with different items placed in different parts of the room. In a grid layout, furniture is arranged in a grid pattern, creating a sense of order and organization. In a free-form layout, furniture is placed in a more organic, unstructured way, creating a sense of movement and flow. Proper furniture layout can help to create a comfortable and inviting atmosphere, while also making the most of the available space. Utility of furniture Utility of furniture refers to its practical use and functionality, such as providing seating, storage, or a surface for working or eating. Utility of space refers to how well a space is designed and organized to meet the needs and activities of the people using it. Both furniture and space should be functional, efficient, and comfortable to use. Visual Criteria of Furniture Layout Visual criteria of furniture layout refers to the aesthetic and design principles that guide the placement and arrangement of furniture in a space. This includes factors such as balance, proportion, scale, symmetry, and focal points. The goal of visual criteria is to create a visually pleasing and cohesive space that is easy to navigate and use. It also includes the use of colors, textures, patterns, and lighting in furniture and space to create a certain ambience, mood or theme. Room Auditing 
Room auditing in terms of space use is the process of evaluating and assessing the functionality and efficiency of a room or space. This typically involves analyzing how the space is currently being used, identifying any issues or inefficiencies, and making recommendations for improvements. Room auditing can be done for various type of spaces such as office, living, and public spaces. Room auditing often includes evaluating factors such as furniture layout, lighting, acoustics, and storage, as well as assessing how well the space meets the needs and activities of the people using it. The end goal of room auditing is to improve the functionality, efficiency, and overall user experience of the space. Room auditing can be used to plan furniture layout for a new project. The process begins with understanding the intended use of the space and the activities that will take place in it. This information is used to identify the necessary furniture pieces and their required dimensions, as well as how much space will be needed for movement and circulation. The room auditing process can also include creating a floor plan and making decisions about the placement of furniture, electrical outlets, and other features. The layout is then optimized to ensure that it is functional, efficient, and visually pleasing, while also meeting the needs of the people who will use the space. Room auditing can also be used to identify any potential issues or areas for improvement, which can be addressed during the design and construction process. There is no one-size-fits-all formula for room auditing as it depends on the specific space and its intended use, but a general approach can be. 1. Define the goals and objectives of the space, identify the intended use of the space, the activities that will take place in it, and the needs of the people who will use it. 2. Measure the space, take accurate measurements of the room and create a floor plan. 3. Assess the current layout and use of the space, observe how the space is currently being used, identify any issues or inefficiencies, and take note of any areas that are underutilized or overutilized. 4. Identify the furniture and equipment needed, determine the types and quantities of furniture and equipment needed to support the intended use of the space. 5. Plan the furniture layout, using the information gathered in steps 1 to 4, create a furniture layout that is functional, efficient, and visually pleasing. 6. Evaluate and improve, once the layout is completed, evaluate it to ensure it meets the goals and objectives of the space, and make any necessary adjustments. 7. Implement and monitor. Implement the new layout and monitor it over time to ensure it continues to meet the needs of the space and its users. It's important to note that the formula may vary depending on the specific needs and requirements of the project, but this can be a general guide to follow. Yet you can try. FL equals FRG. FL, furniture layout. F, collection of furniture items placed in a room. R. Polygonal boundaries or walls. G. Collection of group of furniture. Analysis and synthesis. Analysis and synthesis are key techniques used in the planning of interior and architectural spaces. Analysis involves breaking down a space into its individual elements and understanding their function and relationship to one another. This includes studying factors such as light, color, sound, and circulation. Synthesis, on the other hand, involves bringing all of the analyzed elements together to create a cohesive and functional space. This includes considering how the space will be used, who will use it, and what activities will take place there. By using both analysis and synthesis, designers can create spaces that are not only beautiful but also functional and meet the needs of the people who will use them. An example of using analysis and synthesis in the design of an interior space could be a cafe, Analysis The designer would first analyze the function of the space, understanding that it will be used for customers to sit and enjoy food and drinks. The designer would then study the circulation patterns and traffic flow, ensuring that there is enough space for customers to move around comfortably and that the layout of the space allows for easy flow of customers. The designer would also analyze factors such as lighting, acoustics, and temperature control, making sure that the space is well lit and comfortable for customers. Synthesis The designer would then bring all of the analyzed elements together, creating a cohesive design that incorporates all of the functional requirements. 
This could include designing seating areas that are comfortable and arranged in a way that promotes social interaction, while also creating intimate and private spaces for customers who want a more quiet experience. The designer would also consider the aesthetic of the space, creating a design that is visually appealing and reflects the brand and atmosphere of the cafe. Overall, the designer would use both analysis and synthesis to create a space that is functional, comfortable, and visually appealing, which meets the needs of the cafe customers. Grids and Levels Grids A grid refers to a system of horizontal and vertical lines that organize and structure a space. In interior design and architecture, a grid can be used to create a sense of order and harmony, and to divide a space into functional areas. A grid can also be used to align elements within a space, such as furniture, artwork, and architectural features. Both grid and levels can be used together to create a sense of balance and proportion in a space, with the grid providing a sense of organization and structure and the levels adding a sense of hierarchy and movement. For example, a designer may use a grid to align the furniture in a living room and use levels to create a raised platform for a seating area, or an architect may use a grid to align the windows on a building facade and use levels to create a sense of movement as one moves through the building. In interior design and architecture, a grid is a system of horizontal and vertical lines that organize and structure a space. There are several different components of a grid that can be used in the planning of a space. 1. Horizontal lines. These lines create a sense of width and stability in a space. They can be used to align elements such as furniture, artwork, and architectural features. 2. Vertical lines. These lines create a sense of height and movement in a space. They can be used to divide a space into functional areas or to emphasize the height of a space. 3. Diagonal lines. These lines create a sense of movement and dynamism in a space. They can be used to create a sense of diagonal movement within a space or to create a sense of tension. 4. Intersections. The point where horizontal and vertical lines meet create intersections. These intersections can be used to create focal points within a space and to define different areas within a space. 5. Proportions. The proportion of horizontal and vertical lines can be used to create a sense of balance and harmony within a space. For example, a grid with a higher proportion of horizontal lines will create a sense of stability, while a grid with a higher proportion of vertical lines will create a sense of movement. 6. Modulation. The size and scale of the grid can be used to create a sense of rhythm and movement within a space. For example, a grid with larger modules will create a sense of grandeur, while a grid with smaller modules will create a sense of intimacy. By using these different components of a grid, a designer can create a sense of order and harmony in a space, and can use the grid to align and organize elements within the space. In interior design and architecture, a bay is a unit of measurement used to organize a space using a grid system. Bays function as a basic modular unit that can be used to divide and organize a space. The size and scale of the bay can be adjusted to suit the specific needs of the space. For example, in a retail store, bays can be used to create different product displays, with larger bays used for main product displays and smaller bays used for secondary displays. In a residential space, bays can be used to create distinct living areas, with larger bays used for the living room and smaller bays used for bedrooms. Bays can also be used to create a sense of movement and transition within a space. For example, in a building, a bay system can be used to create a sense of movement as one moves through the building, with larger bays used for public spaces and smaller bays used for private spaces. Levels Floor levels, soffit levels, and other similar terms can be considered part of level names in architecture. They are used to specify the vertical location of different elements within a building, such as floors, ceilings, and mechanical equipment. These terms are often used in architectural drawings and construction documents to ensure that all members of a project team understand the location of different elements in the building. Levels refer to the vertical division of a space, and are used to create a sense of hierarchy and movement within a space. In interior design, levels can be used to divide a space into different functional areas, such as creating a mezzanine level for a bedroom or a raised platform for a seating area. 
In architecture, levels can be used to create a sense of movement and transition between spaces, such as a staircase leading to an upper floor or a split-level home. Here are a few more terms commonly used to describe levels in architecture. Roof level, the highest level of a building, where the roof is located. Mezzanine level, an intermediate level within a building, typically between the first floor and the roof. Basement level, the lowest level of a building, typically below ground level. Plenum level, the area between the structural floor and the dropped ceiling, used for ventilation and HVAC systems. Penthouse level, a level on top of a building, often used for mechanical equipment or as a residential unit. Sub-basement level, a level below the basement, used for mechanical equipment or as a storage area. Split level, a level that is partially above and partially below the main floor level. It's worth noting that different building codes and regulations may use slightly different terminology, but these terms are generally understood within the architecture and construction industries.